I think. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us again. My name is Jim Marshall. This is Clint Babcock. Uh, Catherine is behind the scenes on the keyboards and uh, making sure everything works all right. This is week number eight of these hopefully informative webinars that we've been doing. Our goal in doing these for you is to provide you with some useful information, maybe some best practices for surviving and thriving during these times. Uh, interesting that there's still a lot of business being done despite whatever hardships or whatever obstacles you might have been encountering. The stories that we're getting from our clients and many of you uh, week after week are pretty gratifying. And uh, it's really a privilege for us to be able to work with you on some of those and help you land some of those deals. Today, we're going to be talking about something that initially might not seem to make a lot of sense given today's business environment. It's negotiating leverage. And the, my first thought when we talked about putting this together was how many deals are actually being negotiated? But in actuality, we're negotiating every single day for something, whether it's to close a new deal or whether it's to maybe hang on to a piece of business that we... Uh, that we've enjoyed for a while. Maybe we have to negotiate some concessions or some, um, maybe some flexibility in terms and conditions. You might even be negotiating space at the kitchen table with your kids, with them homeschooling and you trying to do work. So we're negotiating all the time. So today we want to get into some of the best practices, things that we know we should be doing and maybe we forget to do them. Maybe we think we need to slacken off a little bit but these are things that we need to be cognizant of, things that we need to be aware of, and things that we need to employ in our day-to-day -day business practices. So as we always do, we're gonna ask you to participate in the chat. We're gonna ask you to use that chat bar to, uh, for questions, comments. You can even use that chat window just to say hello to others on the webinar. There's a number of people that have been here for several weeks in a row. Hopefully you're getting some uh, value out of those and making some connections. At the end of the presentation today, we're also gonna ask you a simple question, a simple yes or no question. And we're gonna ask you to use the chat bar for that. So why don't we dive in with this. When negotiating with buyers, what is your biggest struggle? And we put together, Clint, a, uh, a poll question on this. Yep, we got a poll question. Tell us about that. So, uh, so in about the next 12 seconds, you're gonna see a poll pop up that's gonna just ask you, Hey, what, what, are you, what are you running into? So uh, take a moment, take a look at the uh, responses there. So what's your biggest issue struggles? Because our, our goal is always to make sure that we stay topical on what are the main things that you're running into so that we can cover. So uh, go ahead and uh, take a moment, click on whichever one is probably the biggest struggle you're having, and then we'll share the results. Run those down for we'll us. We'll dive into For those of us that can't read. All right, can't see. all right. So number one, uh, you know, hey, buyers are liars. Uh, buyers withholding information, uh, bidding against competitors. So you're in more of a competitive environment that uh, your buyers are using that against you. Um, negotiating against yourself would be bidding against yourself or um, bidding against incumbents or negotiating against incumbents when you're trying to unseed them. And then, uh, and then, you know, not taking the time to prepare or, unreasonable pricing requirements and terms coming from your your prospects so this will give us a good gauge because we're gonna we're gonna cover a lot of areas but it'll be nice when we can come back and say hey these are two or three of the top areas that um, that you all have identified that we need to we need to nail down so just take a think, think about what do you run into the most as it relates to negotiating with your prospects can we pick more than one here uh, yeah you yeah, can we pick can pick more, more than, than one, one. good we made it uh, could be all the above and if you select other i hope you're nice enough to take yourself off mute and share with us uh, maybe some of the challenges you might have that aren't listed here all right five seconds a little more time they're still time. uh still ciphering still going through okay good we should have put one in there for all the above <laughs> Yeah. All right. All right. Let's see what the results are. We're going to share the results and let's see. What do we got? 
All right. So uh, top one is bidding against uh, nope buyers withholding information. So uh, so hmm, which means they're withholding information probably throughout the sales cycle, and then at some point in time they start sharing more information. And then uh, we got bidding against competition, uh, bidding against incumbents. So uh, we call that unseating the incumbent, right? There's already somebody there and now um, you got to negotiate that deal through. And then uh, buyers are liars is, uh, is kind of a tough one. <laughs> All right. Never heard of that. All right. So, um, but ultimately buyers withholding information. What about the other? I'm curious what the, who, whoever answered other, I'm wondering what other things that people might be struggling yeah, with. We've got a few others. So uh, those people, if you put other, if there's something that uh, you want to make sure Jim and I are aware of that we might be able to address today, then uh, real quick, take yourself off mute and uh, be able to share with us what your other might be. We don't know what the other is, so hopefully we'll cover it. We will cover it. All right, we will cover it. All right. All right, you can put it in the chat box and we will get to it. So let's uh, kind of paint a picture and uh, kind of give you an idea of what we're gonna talk about today. In negotiating leverage, some of the things that we're going to cover include this, the difference between selling and negotiating. Sometimes we get those confused. They're separate and distinct, but it's important for you to make that distinction between the two. We're gonna talk about negotiation best practices, uh, some of the mistakes that we might make in negotiating. We're going to talk about something called the seven deadly sins. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the gambits and some of the techniques that buyers and customers and prospects use against you. You need to be aware of those and you need to know how to combat those. And we're also going to talk about how to focus on value uh, of your product or service and how to deal with value objections. So we're going to get a lot of material to cover today. So, so let's dive in. So selling versus negotiations. Uh, and the reason why we like to, to separate these, even though they can be intertwined throughout a sales process is, is cause all too often people look at, um, look at, selling and negotiation is, oh, it's all one and the same, but it really takes different skill sets. And we're going to share with you some of the behaviors and some of the important skill sets you've got to have in order to be a good negotiator. Because I know Jim and I, we've both seen really, really good salespeople that struggle when it comes time to negotiate something on the end. And then we've seen some okay salespeople that are really, really good at the negotiations. So we want you to go into this with it is it is absolutely two different skill sets. First thing that I would ask you is if, if I were to say, hey, do you know what's your sales process? Do you know what that is and what that looks like? Odds are you do because you do that on a regular basis, whether it's the Sandler process that you've become familiar with or your own process. But then if I were to say, what's your negotiation process? What does that look like? What are the steps that you take? What are the strategic uh, areas that you know and you plan for? What is your system as it relates to your negotiation process? Usually right about that point in time, it gets pretty wishy-washy. So what we want you to do is look at this as good selling leads to little negotiations, but it will still happen. And a lot of you see that happen on a regular basis. So one of the things we also want you to be aware of is is the longer you can hold off any kind of negotiations through the sales process, the more value that incremental term condition margin becomes for the prospect. Because good negotiators that you're dealing with are gonna try to take chips away from you early on and throughout that sales process. And we've gotta be astute enough to really separate the two and know when we're being negotiated against. We see it happen all the time. People didn't even know throughout the sales process you were being negotiated against. And instead things were giving up that you thought was gonna help you towards the end. You had not a whole lot left when it came time to negotiate because they had already negotiated from you. So selling, negotiations, different processes, different skill sets. Now, pre versus post. Here's some of the things that we've noticed on the things that you got to look at and go, okay, what's, what was it like before? 
and Jim, click through these on, you know, on what you dealt with before. Odds are, if I said, hey, look, over the last year or two, what were some of the most common things that you were negotiated against or negotiated for, you'll see here a short, quick list. Now what's happened in COVID-19, we've been working with a lot of our clients around how you're creating leverage and understanding what is going to be the moves that your prospects and even current clients are going to make as it relates to nego negotiation. I've got one client right now, they are using absolutely as a source of leverage inventory inventory and therefore the lack of inventory that is going to be happening in the third and fourth quarter of certain items and certain technologies that are going to be in short supply because of the supply chain disruption that has happened over the past two months. So what they're able to do is accelerate some of the deals that may have happened in the third or fourth quarter because they're using these areas as leverage and they're starting to understand how to discuss with their current clients around cash flow and understanding that. And you also got to look at it, could it be a limitation? How is your company cash flow wise? And is that causing you to do some skinny deals or to give up some margins in order to increase your immediate cash flow? So all of this starts to come into play, but the, 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 the tactics become a little bit different. And that's why we want to give you the, the tools today to really start working on this. Now, how do you view negotiations? Here's what I want you to do. Look at yourself and think, of, think internally for a moment. How do I negotiate? Do I enjoy it? Do I look forward to it? Is it something that I'm very comfortable with? Because I'm, I'm not going to mention all five of these. I'm just going to pick out a few of these because these are a few of the behaviors we've identified of good negotiators. You know, first one, conflict. Are you the kind of person that is more on the conflict avoidance or do you don't mind seeking it out and addressing it? The stronger you are with conflict, the better negotiator you're going to be because you're going to see it as not necessarily conflict as much as you're going to see it as something that needs to be addressed early on. Ego, how comfortable are, yourself, are you with yourself, your confidence, your experience, your background to be able to take on any negotiations? And then lastly, this is huge, emotional composure. Do you get upset easily? Do you, um, do you get tied into the emotional, of a, emotional part of a, of a deal? And therefore, the more emotional you get, the more you're going to react instead of responding when under the pressure of a negotiation situation. So take a look at these, give yourself a real quick stack ranking. And then lastly, think about the last medium to major purchase you went and did. As a buyer, what kind of a negotiator were you and did you exhibit any of those characteristics? Jim? So what is your negotiating strategy? When you're faced with a situation with a customer or a prospect and you have agreement in principle to a deal, but you still have to negotiate some finer points of the deal, what is your strategy? How do you approach it? You have a sales strategy. Do you have a negotiating strategy? We're big proponents of a win-win solution. Here's what we mean by win-win. It's, it's a deal that satisfies both parties. There's something in it for you, there's something in it for them. It's a very cooperative arrangement, and it's a, very, uh, it's a relationship that is established at that point with the idea and the intention of being long-term and productive, and it's a relationship based on trust. Some people approach negotiating as a win-lose. Uh, I want you to think about this both in your context as a seller and the, the, the context of the buyer. You're gonna run into some buyers that focus on a win-lose scenario, me win, you lose. They triumph over their counterpart. They're very, very competitive. They're, they're looking, they're, they're intent on making sure that somebody is going to lose, they're gonna win. The problem is, the person that's on the losing end of that deal, maybe not now, but eventually they're going to seek some sort of retribution. They're going to seek their pound of flesh. So we got to be careful in terms of what our view is, what's our negotiating strategy. Is it win-win or is it win-lose? So what you need to do is you have to start by understanding the negotiators, the average buyer, the professional negotiator, or what we call sometimes the black belt. 
Um, you might have run into situations like this with some of your clients and customers, some of your buyers. These people are very, very good at what they do. I remember calling on a, uh, a company at one point in time with a number of buyers for a number of different departments. Their client was given a budget to execute the purchase with the instructions as follows. Here's what you have to spend. Whatever you save under that budget, you as the negotiators get to keep and split. So imagine the incentive for them trying to get the best deal they could. And as a result, they would conduct classes. If you go online and look for negotiating classes, you will find dozens of classes that are devoted to how to negotiate to your advantage. This person sent their people to all those classes and it was very, very tough. If we weren't prepared going in, we would be on the short end of the stick. So how do you evaluate the professional buyer? What are some of the traits and the qualities that go into uh, somebody that might be construed or somebody that you might be considered to be a professional? Well, here's some of the characteristics. They have at least three bidders. No matter what, they're gonna take you and they're gonna pitch you against at least two other people to use as leverage against you. They're gonna keep you guessing. They're never gonna let you know where you stand. Well, it looks good, could be good. We're not sure yet. They're always gonna keep you on your guard. They take the deal away. Well, it sounds like this deal is not gonna happen. It sounds like we're not gonna have an opportunity to do business. They're always gonna perform that takeaway. They're looking for free consulting. They're hoping that the more they stall, the more information you're going to give them. Well, let me tell you about this, or let me tell you about that. You're getting no commitment from the buyer, but instead, the buyer is getting unpaid consulting from you. They issue a lot of RFPs for the same reason. They're hoping to come away with some information. They issue RFPs, and the question that I always ask for anybody that's in the RFP submission business, if you don't have some hand in writing and authoring that RFP, chances aren't very good that you're going to get the deal. In fact, I always ask this question for people that respond to a lot of RFPs. If you take a look at the last six to 12 months at the number of RFPs you've completed and submitted, what percentage of those did you win that you had no hand in authoring? You can usually count the responses on one hand out of 100. Not a real good, uh, not a real good scenario. And lastly, they time their purchase. They're always going to time their purchase at the end of the month, at the end of the quarter, at the end of the fiscal year. These buyers know how to do it, and it's our responsibility as sellers to be prepared. So let's talk about sources of leverage during the negotiating process. What are those sources of leverage? Here's one of them. How do you neutralize some of these and how do you increase the positive? We're gonna get into some of those sources, but these are questions you have to ask. What are those sources of leverage? What is it that uh, caused the buyers to think that they are in control and how do they tilt the scales and how do they go about painting the picture and putting things so that the cards are stacked in their favor? And how do you in turn start in the strongest negotiating position? You have to understand some of these characteristics. First, it starts with belief. What do you believe? Clint, why don't you talk about this a little bit? Well, Jim, I like to think of this as you're either building assets or you're causing liabilities, okay? So think, of, think about as we go through these, have you, you can create these into either, either one. So think about the person that has a strong belief in their products and services and what they do. They know where their position is in the market. You're not the, you know, most of our clients aren't the least expensive or the least costly, right? So you know where you are. So your own internal belief about your ability to be able to deliver your products and services and the experience you give your customers is better than what any anybody else is going to give. So if you've got that belief, it strengthens your, your head so that when you go into any negotiation situation, it's there. Now, some of you can look back at some companies you may have worked for before, hopefully not a company that you're working with now, and your belief system about your ability to be able to deliver the products and services you're out there selling just wasn't quite there or isn't quite there. So now guess what? That's a liability. So when 
there's some poking or there's some pushing at your product, your services, your terms, whatever that might be, your belief system isn't strong enough to be able to hold on to that. So therefore, it becomes a liability. Next one is, um, shape, you know, buyer commoditize, right? Needs, needs. Think about this. You probably have opportunities in your pipeline right now. Who needs it more? Who needs the products and services more? Do you need it more than they do? Or do they need it? So think about as you're going through, this is the opportunity to be able to understand, we call it the pains of what's going on in their world so that we can understand why they need this, when they need this versus is our need greater? Do I need it to hit my commission number, to hit my quarterly number? If my need is greater than theirs, then it can become a liability. Obviously, what's the qu quickest way of fixing this? Keeping a full pipeline that you don't need any one deal come the end of the month, end of the quarter in order to hit your number. You have a full pipeline of two or three or four or five opportunities that could come together. And what about time? Um, time is a source of negotiating leverage. I remember one of my first bosses in business used to tell me that there comes a point in any sales or negotiation cycle where time can work for you or can work against you. If you have a deadline, whether it's the end of the fiscal year or it's a start of some sort of a, a promotion or something where you've got to get a commitment, the professional buyers know that the longer they stall, the better the deal they're going to get. It goes back to what Clint said about need. If you have the need, you got to figure out, all right, is time on my side or is time working against me? Buyers know how to do that. Establish the right relationship. So think about this. Would you negotiate harder or easier against somebody that you have a good relationship with? If you've got that trusting relationship, then most people, you're going to take what is presented to you. Versus if I don't know somebody so well um, and I'm just starting to get to know them, I will absolutely negotiate harder. So one of our core mantras is understanding the DISC model and knowing how that helps you to be able to build the commonality and get more information than what you're giving up. And then also looking at this and going, all right, what's the person's style and what can I expect from them from a negotiation standpoint? Real quick lesson, D's, they're gonna to wanna to negotiate um, and they like to have their terms and conditions met and they've got that driver towards that. The nice thing about D's is if you ask them early enough, they will tell you. They don't, they don't hide things as much as other people do. They'll be very direct in what they're looking for. You gotta be prepared for it because it's gonna come quick. Eyes are collaborative negotiators. Eyes, quite frankly, are the toughest ones because they don't even really like to negotiate because that's almost confrontational. But here's what makes them so smart is they're going to go and get other people to help them negotiate the deal. I was talking to an eye the other day and we were talking about this same topic and he's like, oh yeah, he goes, I absolutely don't like to negotiate my own deal, but I love to pull other people in to help negotiate on my behalf. S's are going to take a very structured lack of risk approach to their negotiations and they're going to be very thoughtful and mindful, but they're going to be very piercing in the way that they're going to position things to make you feel like, hey, you're going to want to, you're going to want to work with me because they're the kind of people that are going to make you feel comfortable, but they're going to have a way to work you through in order to get what they want. And then you got your C's, they're going to have more data than you do. They're going to be prepared and they're going to focus on the negotiations with numbers, facts, figures. And if you're not prepared for that, they're going to be able to win because they know the numbers. They know where you fit. They'll, they'll be your ultimate spreadsheet people that'll be able to see where your strengths and weaknesses are. So we got to build relationships. And now think about anybody in your, in your pipeline. Can I identify what kind of disc style? And that's going to help you to be able to understand how they're going to react as a negotiator. One of the um, a D that I negotiated with um, a couple years ago 
early in the process, I said, well, hey, walk me through. I know you probably have to go back and talk to some of your, uh, some of your people to uh, decide whether or not this is, you know, this is something that they're even going to be bought into. And he said, hey, I've already talked to them. He goes, they're already there. I said, so how do you see this working? He goes, well, you're going to give me a number. I'm not going to like it. I'm going to tell you to come off that number. You'll come off it a little bit and we'll decide to do business together. He just opened up the roadmap of exactly how we were going to go through that process. And in our next meeting, it's exactly what happened. I asked the question up front. He was kind enough to share with me. And that's the path we went down. And we had a good two-year relationship of working together. Next. All right. Understanding your buyer's point of view, right? So think about this. As you go through the process, this is what we call um, BATNA. BATNA, understanding, if you haven't heard that term, look it up for a, for a deep definition, but it stands for best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So if you can jump in your buyer's side and say, all right, if they choose not to go ahead with me, what is their alternative? Is their alternative good enough? Do they have a competitor? Can they stay with who they're at? Can they do nothing? This helps you to understand what is their point of view. And it also helps you later on when Jim and I start talking about concessions, what's gonna be important to them. So make sure that you spend a few minutes jumping onto their side of the table. Next. So one of the things we have to understand as a source of negotiating leverage is whose idea is it? Whether it's a proposal, whether it's some sort of a solution, you have to understand that in some way, shape, or form, you have to engage the buyer and give them at least partial ownership of the negotiated solution. What that means is you want to make sure that they're involved. And the theory comes right out of Sandler 101, which is customers and clients and prospects don't argue with their own data. If you can engineer that conversation so an aha moment comes to them where they say to you as the seller, instead of that, why don't we do this? Now they have some ownership of the idea. That entails asking questions. That entails doing some discovery. That entails them coming up with some solutions that they can propose to you. You're the one that has to steer that conversation and, and ask those questions that lead to that discovery. We want to co-create ownership. We don't want it to be just your idea. We don't want it to be just the buyer's idea. Co-created cooperation, win-win solutions. And we have to have the right skill set. This goes back to some of the very basic things that we teach our clients in Sandler, uh, listening, asking questions, establishing upfront agreements and contracts, uh, understanding emotional needs to buy, all those kinds of things. We have to understand what the buyer's process is. We have a process that we use in selling. It's called the Sandler Selling System. Your buyers have a process as well. It's incumbent upon you to understand those gamuts and that process, and then you have to act and respond accordingly. One of the things you have to understand, and we'll, we'll stress it again, is that these buyers, the professional buyers and the black belts, they know what they're doing. If you go into a negotiation unprepared, you don't practice, you don't role play, you don't uh, pre-call plan, what if the buyer says this or what if the buyer says that, chances are you're gonna come out on the short end of the deal. All right, so we've got, uh, we wanna show you and, and talk to you about some of the mistakes we see very consistently. And it's, it's just making sure that you're looking at these and going, all right, this is almost falls under the conceptuals. Don't do these kind of things. We call them the seven deadly sins, but they're really the big core uh, mistakes that, that we gotta make sure that we avoid. So first off, think about who's in your pipeline right now and are, who am I dealing with? Am I dealing with a black belt? Can I tell? And you, you will see certain terminologies and certain things that they will use. The biggest definition of a black belt that might separate them from you, they've studied negotiations. They've either gone to classes, they look at it as the art and the science that it is, and they've read the right books, they've gotten to themselves to a point of where they know how to use the leverage and they know a process in order to be able to negotiate against you. 
If you sell to procurement departments, you can pretty well be sure that they have gone through classes to learn how to negotiate margins out of your deal. They have looked at it as this is part of my profession. And as Jim said earlier, they may get a piece and a cut of that first quote versus the last quote of your business. And they get actually commissioned off how much money they can save the organization and the company. Next, pre-negotiation, a weak pre-negotiation position, need, desperation. Uh, you're not hitting your numbers. You're, it's at the end of the month. Here's the worst thing that I see, the mistakes that are made, and, uh, and it's usually from sales leadership. Sales leadership pulls the rep in, it's a few days before the end of the month, and sales leadership says, okay, what do we gotta do to create urgency to get them to buy by the end of the month? Right, and, and, they're, and they're creating this disease of discounting within the organization because they're telling the rep, what do we need to do? Uh, what can we do? And now you are absolutely negotiating against yourself and you're causing liabilities to kick in because the sales leadership is pushing for the number at the end of the month. We all know when's the best time to buy a car, right? End of the month. And now if we enable and we build up that process and that sort of reputation amongst our clients, then they're, they're going to know. They're smart people. They're going to figure it out. So don't put yourself in that situation. We've got to be in, in, the, in, in almost a, hey, doesn't matter to me when you decide to buy this or not. It all matters on when you need this solution up and implemented. If those are the kinds of words you can use early on, it will really reduce any kind of urgency to be unprepared going into that negotiations. So other deadly sins of negotiating. This is one, making unilateral concessions giving the buyer anything they want just to close the deal. First of all, that's going to form a win-lose relationship. They win, you lose. But you know what? The black belts, the professional buyers, they actually enjoy the battle. They look forward to that. When you go in and you make unilateral concessions and give them anything they want, they're not getting their needs met. They like the fight. They enjoy the fight, and they build a respect for you and for the company. So the rule is never give up something without getting something in return. If they're asking for some sort of a concession, be prepared going in. When they do ask for a concession, what is it that I can get in return? Is it a bigger share of budget? Is it the commitment to do business down the road? Is it consideration on delivery or specifications? Make sure you get something in return. And avoid negotiating against yourself. Happens quite often where let's say hypothetically you submit a bid or a proposal, you don't hear anything back from the buyer. Now you take that as a signal that they don't wanna buy. And who makes the first move? You do by coming back with a better offer. So you're negotiating against yourself. One of the deadly sins you have to avoid at all costs. Here's another one, talking too much. When you're in a negotiating session and you say something and the buyer gives an objection or says, you know what, I can't do that. I we start spewing at the mouth. We know in sales, uh, anybody that we work with, if I say to you, what's the 70-30 rule? You know what that is. You gotta let the prospect or the buyer do 70% of the talking. What happens in a negotiating is we feel the pressure to get the deal done. We start talking too much. And now all of a sudden the buyer or the prospect is in control instead of you being in control. No one ever listens themselves out of a deal. You talk yourself out of deals, you never listen yourself out of a deal. And here's another one, losing control of your emotions. Great case in point. You make a great, uh, you make a good competitive uh, offer. You make a great proposal. They turn you down. They don't like it. The child in us, the rebellious child in us says, I can't understand why they don't want that deal. I gave them the best deal in the world. He who loses control of their emotions is the one that loses. And when under pressure, you got to be aware of this. You got to avoid the fight or flee mentality. If they're telling you that they don't want to do business with you or they're throwing up objections, don't pick a fight. Don't run away. You have to handle it in a very adult, level-headed, rational manner. Yeah, I think that goes into react versus respond. If you've done yes. the preparation, you're not going to end up making that mistake uh, because here's what happens to me and it probably happens to you. You're driving home, you're, you're doing 70 miles an hour down the highway, and the next thing you know, that prospect you've been waiting for calls you, and now, boom, you're right into an, a negotiation situation. So you're not there. So entering in 
unprepared is skill set based as well as what's my first move and documenting out what do your buyers do to negotiate against you? What are the three or four or five major gambits that they do and how am I going to respond the moment they start to negotiate? What does that look like? If you don't have those first words down of where you're gonna go, then it puts us in a situation where we may be absolutely unprepared to handle that conversation. You know, so back to the unilateral concessions, one of the questioning techniques we use a lot is let's pretend, right? That might be the first thing. Hey, let's pretend we, let's pretend we could do that. And I'm not saying we could. Now you got to ask for something. Would you be willing to uh, do uh, net 10 terms? You know, would you be willing to sign a two-year engagement? You know, something along those lines to be able to get that next step and that commitment of what's going to happen that's going to make sure that you know exactly how to be prepared so that you don't end up with paralysis of, of, okay, I don't know exactly where to go. Next. All right. Money's never the real issue. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. It is here. We make it <laughs> believe here. Here's the best story I've got about this. I was doing a negotiation talk for a technology association. It was a women in technology association a few years ago probably maybe 60, 70 uh, lady executives in the room and we're talking about this and uh, towards the end, a uh, this really nice lady raises her hand. She said, look, she goes, I am the uh, CIO of, and it was a local city. And she said, um, you know, it's interesting sitting here and listening to this because there are some vendors and partners of mine that are actually in this room. And she said, look, as a government entity, I absolutely need all of my vendors to believe that price is the number one thing. Hey, we're a government entity. I got to put things out to bid over a certain amount. I've got to get, uh, get that and everything I do is public record. She goes, but if I only chose the lowest price and everything that somebody submitted, I would have lost my job a long time ago. It is definitely not about the money. It's important, but it's not about the money. If you've got a better solution, I will find the money or I will wait to get the money in order to be able to do that. So even somebody and some of you sell into the government world and you've got the proposals, if you do your work ahead of time, it doesn't come down to the money. Well, and as evidence of that, all you have to do is look in the mirror. Think about the purchases that you've made over the last 30 or 60, 90 days. Mm -hmm. Did you buy the least expensive item or product or service. If I think about, uh, for example, automobiles, what's in your driveway? If it was all about price, everybody will be driving a uh, 1967 Dodge Dart. You those can get those nice. for $25. Those are nice cars. They were nice cars. I had one. Yeah. But you're not. Lexus, Mercedes, Infinity, whatever. It's not about the price. It's about wants and needs. People make decisions intellectually, but they buy emotionally. We have to understand that in the negotiating process. By the way, before we get into the dirty dozen here, Clint, we're gonna talk about this. I noticed that we're getting a lot of questions in the chat box. Please feel free to continue to put questions in that chat box. Uh, some people are just emailing us directly. We'll get to those at the end, but talk about the dirty dozen here, Clint. So we, uh, we also call this the deal makers dozen. Take a look at this list. This is, um, you guys remember a thing called um, Spygate? Spygate, um, thankfully, we've got a, a quarterback that was involved in that that's here playing for us now. Um, <laughs> which Spygate was uh, all about stealing signs. Um, there's been another oh, yeah. uh, Houston yeah. company or, or organization that's been accused of that. Here's what I want your mind to think. If I can steal their signs, if I can know what play they're going to run, I can have, a, uh, I can have an answer to it. So we've identified the top ones. And, and when you look at these, I need you to look at them and go, okay, which ones fall into the ones that I see most often? So we're, we don't have time to go through all 12, uh, but I'll pick out a couple and then Jim can pick out a couple. Which um, ones do you like on there? I'm gonna go with your competition is cheaper, ah. right? And then, um, and then it, next we're gonna tell you how to kind of work through that and what the system is gonna be. but if they ever use the competition is cheaper. 
your first response without missing a beat is going to be our, our steps that you're, we're going to show you. And it's going to sound like this. Hey, uh, you know, first of all, I really appreciate you just sharing with me that, um, that our competition came in with a, with a lower solution, lower valued solution than ours. Um, look, I, I can assure you that based upon what we discussed and based upon how we're going to address your issues, that our solution is going to absolutely take care of that. But hey, let me ask you a question. Is there a reason why my competition valued their solution so low? Right? We can't let this rock us. We've got to look at it as they have a lower value, a lower solution. Why would our competition value that lower? It's not us to be able to defend and justify. What do, we, what do most people do right there? Oh, your competition is cheaper? Oh, well, uh, well, can you send me their quote so that I can do an apples for apples comparison? If you put your quote together right, then that should be your quote, your estimate, and your scope of work. It isn't about trying to do that. Or, oh, well, uh, where do I need to be? Done. You're done. Negotiation's over. They already won. And now you're trying to match your higher valued, higher purposeful solution to what, they, what, what your competition is doing. It's not where we want to go. There's a couple on here, Clint, that go together, the flinch and the emotional outburst. <laughs> Maybe you've been in a situation where wow. you're going in, some of you are in the professional proposal writing business, and you take your proposal in, and they immediately they go to the last page, and they go, ooh, or they say, what the heck are you talking? There's no way you're going to. By the way, those of you that are in the professional proposal writing business, just an idea for you. Next time you go in with a proposal, Leave the last page off where the price is. It'll drive them nuts. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? But the point is, is that you got to maintain a level head. You can't get emotionally involved. They're going to try this on you. You cannot react. You got to respond. The other one here that uh, jumps off the page at me, Clint, is escalation. I love escalation. Where somebody says, you know, I really can't afford to pay this now, but if you'll work with me on the price, I can tell you that there's going to be a lot of business coming down the road. Work with me now and we'll, we'll make sure we'll give you top consideration the next time we, we go to market. Mm -hmm. Uh-uh. You got to be prepared for that. Yeah. What else jumps uh, off the page here? Hot potato. You're going to see potato. this one right now. Um, you've given them a quote or proposal. They call you and they say, hey, look, um, based upon COVID-19, um, you know, our, our budgets have, uh, have, have, we've all been slashed. So uh, our, our you know, you, you're going to need to come off of this about 20% in order for us to be able to move forward. They're taking their problem and throwing you the hot potato to try to solve their problem. So what do we end up doing, which is the absolute wrong first move? Well, okay, maybe we can value engineer our solution to uh, maybe we can change some products and services to be able to get down to that lower amount. It is absolutely not your first move that you're going to want to make. It's going to be your third move you're going to want to make. But right now, they just threw you over a problem. That's not your problem. That's their problem. How are they going to deal with that? What are they going to do? That's the mindset we got to be in when we see that. So yeah. let's get into some of the strategies. How do we mitigate some of these things? We have to recognize and we got to be prepared to deal with them. But once we get down to the finish line, how do we conclude that negotiation in a win-win scenario? So we've come up with what we call the negotiating playbook. Clint, take us through that. So everything that you've known about Sandler, which you've been around for a while, you know that we've got systems and processes, right? So if you don't have a system, you end up only relying on what we call the art. There's no science to the process. So you just end up winging it. So what we really want to do is we want to give you that first, second, and third moves, and we call it the negotiation playbook that you're going to be able to use on almost all 12 of those gambits that we showed. So first thing, first thing out of your mouth is what we call, we, we call it um, stroke and assurance. And we also call it acknowledge, reassure, and ask a question. That's what, that's what we're calling it. It's A-R-A, -A, acknowledge, reassure, and ask a question. And you heard me just do it as it related to the, the competition is cheaper. So pick anything. What is that first thing that they say to you? 
hey, um, you know, our, our budgets got cut. Um, we, uh, you know, we, you know, the incumbent, the current provider, which a lot of you said is some of the tougher things to negotiate against was, uh, you know, is, is coming back strong. Uh, you also said in the survey that we did, the poll that we did earlier was hidden information. Well, if they start to negotiate with that hidden information, we got to back things up. So how this is going to sound is you're going to acknowledge, hey, I appreciate you, you sharing that with me. You know, it could even be the, uh, hey, you're going to need to sharpen your pencil. Uh, I appreciate you, you sharing with that with me that, hey, you know, our, our quote was a little bit higher and you want me to sharpen our pencil, which is the acknowledgement, gives them the understanding that you heard it. Now, we got to reassure back to the pains, issues, challenges that we heard earlier. So look, I can reassure you that based upon what we talked about and how we work through each individual issue and challenge that you have, our solution is absolutely going to be able to meet what you've got. And that's the confidence, that's the ego, that's the comfortness in the conflict, that's the emotional composure coming from the adult aspect. And now you got to ask a question. And that's got to give, give, get it back to them. Look, um, but hey, based upon what you've asked about, is there, is there a reason why our competition or is there a reason why the incumbent seems to be making some moves now in order to try to maintain your business after you've had some bad experiences with them. It's to get the focus back onto them and not the focus on whatever they said, it was money, terms, can, you know, whatever that might be. That is first move you've got to have down immediately. Here's the one that I get a lot of times, Jim, and you probably do too. Uh, hey, Clint, I know we've got about 18 people uh, that we're, we're ready to, that we're going to put in there. Look, I've got this other group of, of, of account managers or customer service. Hey, um, would it be okay if we included them as well, but, um, but I don't really want to pay any more for them to be included in the training? Hey, look, I appreciate you asking. Look, I can, I can assure you that based upon what we talked about, uh, you know, the 18 people and the issues and challenges, um, that we're going to be able to address and work them through is, uh, is absolutely going to be on target. Um, but let me ask you a question. Is, is there a reason why you don't want to invest in those other four people that you want to put in there? Right? It's a way to get it back off. That's a first move. You're absolutely giving nothing. Absolutely giving nothing. But a question back to them to further understand that, hey, you're not just gonna wilt right over. Because where, where do most people go? They most quickly go right into some kind of concession. concession. Yeah. And that's not you're gonna be your first move. This move alone handles, I'll say 50, 60% of the negotiations you're gonna be in because they're doing their good job as a buyer. They're pushing something out there. We gotta do our job as a salesperson and be ready for that first move. If we're not, we're going to lose right from the get-go. So we got to give them a stroke and an assurance. I appreciate the question. If I were you, I'd probably be asking the same thing. That's step number one. Step number two, give nothing but sweat. You got to struggle. You have to act consistent with your position. You got to say, gosh, you're really putting me in a tough spot. I'm not so sure we're going to be able to do anything about that. I'm really going to have to think about this. One of the things we say in selling is that sales is acting. Sales is nothing but a Broadway show played by a psychiatrist. Negotiations the same way. Give them nothing but sweat. Let them see you're struggling. You're trying to come up with a solution, but you know what? Don't let them make their problem your problem. What's the third one, Clint? Well, think those of you that are familiar with negative reverse selling, uh, that's part of step two, right? Uh, go back to step two. The go. struggle, the struggle is making them feel like they're taking a pound of flesh off of you, making it seem to them, and this is where sales is acting a little bit, that you are, that you're, you're, you know, you're, you're struggling with this. Now, part of this too is going back and saying, look, um, look, maybe there's, maybe there's something that you didn't like about what we put together. 
maybe you must, you must have a reason. Is there something about what we've discussed or talked about that is making this solution not look like it's going to be able to handle, handle uh, what we discussed? You got to do a little bit of strip lining. You got to start slightly pulling the solution, pulling what you presented away to really find the truth of what's behind that. And that's going to help you to do that step two, because it, some of them, step one, they're going to be able to fold right there. Those are going to be your average negotiators, but your professional and your black belts are going to blow through that. Now you got to make it seem to them like, hey, that maybe this isn't a good fit. And it's a tough, tough move, but you got to have the skill set to be able to do that. Because then when we get to get, if we make it through that, in other words, if they say, yeah, but here's, here's what's going on, here's what's happening. Now, step three is understanding the art of concessions. This is understanding that we've taken the time to know what's of value to them. Um, think real quick, have you ever heard of pie negotiations? If you haven't, it's a great thing to look up. P-I-E, just like the, you know, eating a pie, pie negotiations. The key concept of pie negotiations is understanding the differences between going, all right, this is the size of the pie and we're all trying to get our, our bigger slice of it. Understanding concessions and the art and the psychology behind it is going, look, what if I just baked a bigger pie? If they're asking me for something, that may be okay, but how can I make the pie bigger? How can I provide more value to them without losing my margins or giving up something that I just don't want to give up. And that is making the pie bigger. So that could be adding additional services that makes the pie bigger for a longer contract. It could say, you could be looking at it and going, how am I going to expand this? So mapping out, what is your buyer going to ask for? What are we going to ask for in return? And maybe your number three or number four is any kind of drop in price. So the first move is what can you give up? that's not gonna be of, of, of high cost to you, but of high value to your customer. And that's the art of understanding concessions. Give slowly, give incrementally, as you're gaining along the way. And that's where let's pretend comes into play a lot because you're not making any kind of commitments unless they're making a commitment, which could be, hey, you know, let's pretend we did do this. I'm not saying we could, would you move forward with the deal based upon what we just discussed? That's asking for that commitment in order to get the deal done. So you see here, everything that we just talked about, right? Making sure that you understand what that process is going to look like and documenting them out. Jim, next. So, so we've, um, we've actually prepared a worksheet um, we're big believers in systems and processes. Uh, we talk about cookbooks. We talk about pre-call planners. We talk about business plans. We've got one for negotiating as well. It includes understanding what, uh, what some of those concessions are most valuable to least valuable. What am I going to be able to bend on? What, uh, what's the value of those concessions? What kind of concessions is the buyer going to ask you? And what's the rank order of importance for those? If you would, uh, if you'd like a copy of that, we have that and we're happy to send that to you, but we can't stress enough the importance of going into a negotiation prepared. If you go in and just wing it, be prepared to suffer the consequences because I guarantee you, in fact, uh, this, this one uh, buyer that I had this conversation with many years ago, she says, we practice this. I can tell you that nine out of 10 salespeople that come in to see us don't practice. So we have a leg up before they even walk in the room. You got to prepare and you got to practice. This is a way to do it. If you need a copy of that, happy to send it to you. So. Yeah, I got a, I got a question. Phil, uh, take yourself off mute to put, uh, put a little bit of life around this um, um, and make sure I got this right. Uh, Phil, you said, how do I respond to negotiating price if you are bidding on same product and service? So, yeah, so let's say um, it, it's a formal bid and the bid requires that XYZ product is to be bid. So you're not, you, so there's no differentiation of product at that point. And mm -hmm. the service obviously is in, installing the security system. And the price objection comes up then because 
in, in your uh, in your presentation earlier, you had described um, that you that we had put our bid together. Why did the competition, you know, lower the value of, of the of their bid of the product that they're offering? Mm -hmm. So, what, what, so I'm just trying to get a, a grasp around. Um, what, what the comeback would be at that point. Similar product, similar service, similar price. Yeah, yeah, so, so think, Phil, do you remember when I said there's three different ways to differentiate yourself from the competition? One was your, your, your experience, the experience that they have with you going through that process. The second is that you've been able to create a unique solution. And then the third is how you differentiate that solution, right? The deliverable of that, how you can deliver that. So in an RFP situation like that, we're a big believers in break the rules. They're giving you the rules. What in that can you break? What in that can they make, can you do out of those three? Can you have a different deliverable? Can you meet that better? Can you add in something in there that they didn't ask for that would be of creative value? And thirdly, because some of the products that you're gonna sell are gonna be commoditized they're going to look at that, but they're going to look at it also as the overall quote and opportunity. One of the things that we teach a lot of our clients, if they're, if they are in the bidding business is always give two bids, always turn in two bids. One is everything that they've asked for right down to what they want, even though you and I both know that probably isn't going to work or they're not going to be happy with that. And then the bid that says, Hey, if it were me, this is how I would do it. Have you done that before, Phil? Well, yeah, actually, that's a very good point. I, I, um, and I guess I should have uh, considered that. But yes, we have given a value added or uh, a bid because we've where, you know, they were prepared two or three years ago by the time they actually finally come out, especially in government, right, mm -hmm. or the military. I mean, they're really behind in their technology. But we do offer that uh, in, in, especially on larger bids. Yes. Thanks for the question, Phil. So yeah. here's what we'd like you to do. In the chat box, answer the question that's on your screen now. What's the one best practice you can implement from this session? Or what was your one takeaway? Take a minute and just tap it in the, uh, in the chat box. We'll read a couple of those as they come in. And we said at the start that we were going to have a question for you, a simple yes or no question. And here's the yes or no question. You've been nice enough to join us for these webinars over the last uh, six or seven or eight weeks. We hope you've gotten some value out of them. Uh, this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. Those of you that we work with on a regular basis, you know there's an awful lot more stuff, a lot more content. So I'm, I'm gonna ask you to respond in the chat box with a simple yes or no answer. The no answer might look something like this. You've enjoyed these webinars. You've got a lot of practice out of them. You got a lot of enjoyment. You got some best practices. You got uh, some things that you can help use to grow your business. Um, you might be wanting to learn a little bit more, but not at this time. Maybe it's not the right time. And uh, if you want to have a conversation with us eventually, but now is not the night, right time to do that, just type in the word no. And do it privately to do it uh, privately. myself or to Jim yep. or to Catherine uh, that's logged in. Do it in privately. There. So a no would be, yes, I'm interested. Yes, I've gotten some value, but I'm not interested in talking to you about what we do on an ongoing basis at this time. Just type in the word no. On the other hand, a yes would be, yeah, I'd like to find out a little bit more about what you guys do at Sandler Training. Uh, there might be an opportunity for us to work together. We don't know what that looks like yet. All yes means is that sometime in the next 24 hours, you're going to get a phone call or an email from us and set up a time to sit and have that conversation. No commitment is just a conversation. If that describes you, you can put in the yes. We're good with either answer. Doesn't matter. We'd like yeses, but if it's a no, we understand completely. Lastly, we want to leave you with this. As we always do, there's a lot of information in here. There's lots of content in the uh, cell portal which is the Sandler e-learning library. You're welcome to log in and take advantage of that. Many of you have done that. Uh, I got a call last week from somebody that went in and said, oh my God, I had no idea there was so much content in there. There's lots of best practices. Those are yours to use and, and do with as you see fit. 
Uh, Clint, any comments in the box that uh, we want to highlight? Anybody have any uh, takeaways? Yeah, Catherine, what do we got? Practice, good. Batna. Batna. Okay. Come prepared to negotiate, role play it. Yep. 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 Good. Yeah, All emphasis right. on preparing for the negotiations. Spy gate. <laughs> And let's not forget, buyers are nice people. They have a job to do too. How prepared are you? All right. So last, last couple, last two comments that I've got. Uh, number one is um, you got to practice. Next couple things you're looking to buy. Next place that you go, you know, don't don't beat up on the restaurant people right now. That's the, we're, we're not there to negotiate with them. They need all the help we can get. But if you're going to go buy furniture, a TV. Uh, heck, whenever I go play golf, I go up to the pro shop and I say, hey, um, I, don't, I, 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 I thought I saw a coupon or something out there. I don't, I don't, I don't suppose there's anything. And they kick you, them out. You'd be surprised <laughs> once. You'd be surprised how many times somebody helps, helps to be able to find some way of giving me a discount. One time the person said, are you a PGA member? I, go, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, how would I know that? I'm not so sure. I, I played PGA courses and I watch it on TV and he goes, ah, I'll give you my discount. Done. Right, so it's just those nice little pokes. Practice, practice that way. And then, lastly, I'm going to do a plug for my book. All oh right. yeah! So, uh, so uh, I've been working the last uh, couple years with uh, Sandler Corp, and uh, come July, maybe August at the latest, uh, I've been working on the uh, Sandler book for negotiations. It's going to be called uh, "Negotiating from the Inside Out: A uh, Playbook for Business Negotiations." So, uh, so look for that to come out. And uh, when it does, hopefully you'll uh, you'll you'll How much pick is the up book? a copy. Um, One hundred and fifty bucks. Is I that think. negotiable? <laughs> okay. One hundred and fifty bucks. I think we can no. get you a deal on it. Yeah, yeah, no, somewhat less than that. I'm, we're still negotiating. I got it. Book, All right, good. So. All right, that wraps it up for this week. We'll see you next week. Thanks for participating. If you need us at all, just reach out to us, phone, email. We're here to help. Have a great week. Thanks, guys.